Good morning and welcome. Special welcome to the folks who are watching at home. It's good for us to be together for worship. Some announcements as we begin. St. John is participating in God's work. Our hands that be today at noon will meet over at Luther Home of Mercy. It sounds like we're going to be helping residents play baseball and also doing some projects for those who don't play. I hope you can join us again, Luther Home, at noon. St. John is also supporting Sack for a Sack again this year. Every time the Genoa defense sacks the opposing team's quarterback, St. John donates a $50 sack of groceries to the Genoa Food Pantry. If you would like to participate and support the program and the food pantry, you can mark your donation sack for a sack and place it in the offering plate or drop off a donation in the church office. The Chosen returns in two weeks, so on September 22nd, you can join us after worship for lunch and a continuation of this wonderful series. There will also be a blood drive at St. John on September 28th, that's a Saturday. We need people to sign up to donate blood, of course, and also volunteers to help at the drive. There is a sign-up sheet on the church office door if you're able to help us out. Our faith practice reading this past week was from the eighth chapter of Job. So in this chapter, we hear from Job's friend, Bildad. He also says Job is getting what he deserves. What's his advice to Job? in verses six, I'm sorry, five and six. Did anyone catch that? Go ahead, Mona. If you Excellent. Exactly right. Repent, he says. If you make supplication, surely you will be restored. Our readings each week are sequential, so this coming week we're reading from chapter 9. Let us now prepare our hearts, our minds, and our spirits for worship. Anger, rich in kindness, loving and forgiving. 
Will you please stand for the confession and forgiveness? Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Let us confess our sin and come to God for healing. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have honored you with our lips, but have harmed our neighbors with our tongues. The cravings at war within us cause conflicts and disputes. In our desire to be first, we make distinctions among ourselves. We place the needs of the poor and the suffering last. In your great mercy, forgive us our sins. Draw near to us with grace in time of need, and turn us to follow in the way of Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. God promises to forgive our iniquity and remember our sin no more. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, the source of eternal healing, your sins are forgiven. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Save, comfort.
comfort and defend us, gracious Lord. Gracious God, throughout the ages you transform sickness into health and death into life. Open us to the power of your presence and make us a people ready to proclaim your promises to the whole world. Through Jesus Christ, our healer and Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The first reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 35. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongues of the speechless sing for joy. For the waters shall break forth in the wilderness and the streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. The second reading is from the book of James, the second chapter. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor, you say, stand there, or sit at my feet. 
Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blasphemy the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. transgressors. For those who keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who says, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For the judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the seventh chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice, but a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Seraphonician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home and found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee. In the region of the Decapolis, they brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hands on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowds, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then he looked up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Our gospel today contains two miracles. One for a woman's sick daughter, the other for a man who is deaf. Are they somehow related? 
or are they just next to each other chronologically? What do you learn about Jesus from these encounters? What do you notice about these two miracles? How do you read this? Staying with the idea that we read scripture in a community of faith and we all approach from a different direction, I'm interested to know how this informs or inspires your faith. I'll have Andy set a timer so we don't drag on too long. Who's willing to get us started? Gonna help me, Deanna? Tim bailed you out last week. <laughs> Yeah, that's a pretty harsh response. Yes. Yeah. We, we kind of, yeah, we, we soften that up some in the English, but yeah, Jesus was not being very nice. That's, that's almost like an ethnic slur, like you're no good, you're, yeah. And coming out of the mouth of Jesus, we go, oh, well, that's, that's kind of weird. Yeah, so what do we do with that? What do you do with a time when Jesus isn't very nice? Is he just playing along with the culture? Is he... I don't know. He does give the crumbs. The dogs yeah. give the crumbs. And maybe that's good enough. Yeah. I, I was reading one commentator noticed that Jesus got into a lot of debates with people and this is the one time that he lost he kind of gave in and said yep you're right you got the better of me and I thought that was kind of interesting that it's a, a Seraphonician woman and he's like yeah you made a good point and you're right and he he gave in I thought oh that's kind of an interesting observation yeah thank you any others Do you It could have been. I, I, some people have said that. It's that he was kind of testing the disciples. Oh, this is what they would have thought. Because, yeah, it's, it's uncomfortable to hear Jesus say something like that. So we, we don't quite know what to do with that. Go along with the crowd. Oh, they're all piece yeah. of nothing. So treat her like that. And then if she's got the faith to come here to ask me, see if she's got the faith to stand up to yeah. Everybody else and talk back. Yeah. I, I think her, her demonstration of faith is definitely something we can take out of that. Because to be told, shut up, go away, you're no good. And then to be able to come back and say, well, yeah, maybe I am. Maybe I'm just a dog. But even dogs get something. That's, that's a very powerful demonstration of faith. You can see why the gospel writers would want to be sure to include that story because that's a, that's a powerful demonstration of faith, yeah. Good observation, thank you. Are there others? Okay, thank you, thank you. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. At first glance, today's gospel seems pretty straightforward. Jesus heals a woman's daughter and then helps a deaf man to hear. Nothing too surprising, right? We've read about Jesus doing the same sort of thing a dozen times before. I think what makes these healings unique is where Jesus performed them. Usually, we read of Jesus performing miracles in and around Galilee. He tended to work close to home. But these miracles occur outside the boundaries of his Galilean ministry. 
Tyre and then Sidon, where we meet the woman with the sick child, is up north in modern-day Lebanon. The Decapolis, where we meet the deaf man, was set east of Galilee in present-day Jordan. It got its name from the ten major Roman cities in that area. The point is, these were places well outside of Jewish territory. We have to ask, what's Jesus doing way up there? Why is he hanging out with Romans? Why is he so far from home? And if we keep reading in Mark's Gospel, we see Jesus feeding a huge crowd again. But this time, it's not the familiar 5,000 near Capernaum, it's a crowd of 4,000 on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. That's the Gentile side. That's the side that Jewish mothers probably warned their kids not to visit. Nothing good happens around those Gentiles. You don't go over there. It seems Jesus was pushing the boundaries of his ministry beyond Galilee reaching out to the surrounding areas. More importantly, he was broadening the scope of his ministry to include both Jews and Gentiles, which would have been pretty shocking for his disciples. Jews and Gentiles just didn't interact. Hanging out with Gentiles, that was out of bounds, which perhaps leads us to ask, what are the boundaries of the kingdom? How far does it extend? How inclusive should Jesus' disciples be when they relate to the wider world? Clearly, Jesus had some ideas that made people uncomfortable. And as we explore these questions, maybe we can bring it a little bit closer to home and think about the boundaries of our own faith and how open we are to understanding and accepting others. I remember reading about an experiment where a psychologist asked participants to write down the names of 10 people they considered to be friends people they enjoyed being with, people they liked, people they feel most comfortable relating to. And then he'd ask them to describe their friends in terms of their age, their race, education, religion, political views, whether they're married or single, had children or none, a host of other categories. When participants were finished, what they found was a striking similarity between the people you like the best and, are you ready for this? Yourself. Surprise, we're naturally connected best with people who are like us. Birds of a feather flock together, as the saying goes. Okay, maybe not such a surprise. This is probably nothing new but it's good to remind ourselves of that every now and then. We naturally tend to associate with people who are most like us. Now, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, but we're called to go beyond. Growing up means broadening our horizons. Maturing in faith means expanding our circle to include those who don't just reflect our own image, but also challenge us to think and act in new ways. Years ago, preacher and theologian J.B. Phillips wrote a book called Your God is Too Small. In it, he challenged people to expand their understanding of who God is and what God is doing in reconciling the world through Jesus Christ. If Phillips were around today, I wonder if he would write a follow-up title, Your Kingdom is Too Small, where he would challenge readers to look beyond the familiar, cozy walls of their own congregation and embrace a much wider diversity of people 
than we might have ever imagined. If that idea makes you feel a little uneasy, don't worry, you're not alone. The disciples faced the same challenge. Do you remember the story of Philip in the book of Acts? So after Stephen was stoned, Christians fled Jerusalem to save their lives. Philip ended up in Samaria, which, if you remember, was another one of those places that wasn't exactly friendly territory for Jews. Philip should have laid low. He should have kept his head down and just waited until it was safe to return home. Conventional wisdom said, Samaritans are bad news. But Philip didn't lay low. Instead, he shared the good news of Jesus with the Samaritans. And to everyone's surprise, they embraced the faith. When Peter and the other disciples heard about it, they rushed up to Samaria to see for themselves. Sure enough, the gospel had spread from Jerusalem to Judea and now to Samaria, just as Jesus said it would. And it wouldn't be long before it reached the ends of the earth. So here we are, asking the same sort of questions the disciples had to wrestle with. What are the boundaries of our faith? Do we believe that someone has to be a Lutheran to be in God's favor? Or maybe just a Protestant? Do they even have to be Christian? Do they have to speak English? Does our faith include people of different races and nationalities and cultures? There's a scene in the musical Shenandoah where an older mountain couple sits down to eat with their son and daughter-in-law. Before they dig in, the father offers a prayer. Lord, bless me and my wife, John and his wife, us four, no more. Amen. Well, that's a kind of faith, I guess but it's not very inclusive. Those boundaries are pretty tight. Jesus is challenging us to expand those boundaries. In today's passage from Mark, we see Jesus moving beyond the familiar, reaching out to those who were different, those who were considered outsiders, people he should have avoided and left alone. But instead, he spoke words of healing and brought a message of God's grace. Jesus invites us to do the same. That means as we reflect on this passage, we need to ask ourselves, what are the boundaries of our faith? How wide is our circle? Are we willing to step beyond our comfort zones and reach out to those who are different from us? Are we ready to embrace the fullness of God's kingdom, which includes all people, no matter who they are or where they come from? Whether we think that task will be easy or difficult, may we be inspired by the example of Jesus, who didn't just stick to the safe and familiar, but ventured out to bring the good news to all. And may we have the courage to follow in his footsteps, expanding the boundaries of our faith and welcoming all into the embrace of God's love. Amen.
church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn together in the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray with confidence for the Church, God's good creation, and all who are in need. Awaken in our communities of faith a spirit of radical hospitality. Encourage our churches to celebrate and embrace people of diverse backgrounds, experiences, and abilities. Deepen our commitment to ecumenical, ecumenical and interreligious partnerships. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Bring forth water to nourish plants and animals in places suffering from drought. Renew our commitments to protect rivers, lakes, and streams, and make us good stewards of water in our homes and communities. Preserve wetland habitats and the creatures that make their homes there. Hear us, O God. Inspire leaders of cities, nations, and tribes to lead with wisdom and humility. Bring peace among peoples in conflict and strengthen global commitments to nonviolent solutions. Guide all who seek refuge from war to a safe haven. Hear us, O God. Comfort all who live with chronic illness. Surround them in your tender embrace and sustain all who provide ongoing care and support. Bring hope and healing to people struggling with addiction and nourish the spirits of all who are in recovery. Today we pray especially for Kimberly, Doug and Carolyn, Elaine, Phyllis and Wayne, Arlene, Richard and Tom, Dennis and David, Linda, Aiden, the friends and family of Jeanette Lenz, and all of those we name before you now. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Nourish in all people the gift of your creating spirit. Inspire artists and musicians, woodworkers and quilters, poets and dancers. Revive those whose artistic wells have run dry and aliven all who doubt their creative talent. Hear us, O God. We give you thanks for all who have died and now find their rest in you. May their faithful witness guide us in our daily life. Hear us, O God. We entrust these and all our prayers to you, holy God, in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. You may be seated. One theologian wisely observed, look where you spend your money and you'll see where your heart is. We invest not just our time, but also our resources in what's important to us. For many of us, our money is spent on an assortment of stuff. But Jesus told his followers to store up treasures in heaven where moth and rust don't destroy, where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
That's our challenge to invest in the eternal, to set our mind on things above. Even though we're not sending ushers up and down the aisle with offering plates, we still take time in our worship to highlight the response of faithful giving. As we give to God and invest in his work of the kingdom, that's where our hearts will be fixed and focused. Giving to God prioritizes our lives and is evidence for our love for and partnership with him. Let us join in our offering prayer. Blessed are you, O God, source of every gift of your creation. By these gifts and with our lives, help us to serve one another and all in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. As the grains of wheat are scattered on the hill, are gathered into one to become our bread, so may all your people that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. 
Again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Oh, 
Will you please stand? Let us pray. Holy God, you have welcomed us to this meal and fed us with dignity at your table. Send us now to welcome others and to be at peace with one another. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The love of God overflow in you. The grace of our Savior Jesus Christ fill your hearts and the life of the Spirit bless you and give you peace. Amen. Thanks be to God. Thank you. You're a very good.